Chilukek reached the smouldering metal wreck almost at the same time as the soldiers. Various pieces of metal and other materials were scattered a good distance from the impact, but thankfully, no one had been injured. Many watched in horror as flames danced on the metal contraption, flickering up and down, melting the surrounding snow. What most caught Chilukek's action, however, was the large blaze mounted atop of the metal beast. They were still maintaining some degree of momentum and spinning dangerously fast. He was careful to avoid the blades as he approached, crouching to make sure they would not connect with his head. As the base reacted to the event unfolding, soldiers poured out from their barracks and the command tent. As he neared the strange machine, Shiluke heard an officer shout at him, Stop! It's dangerous! Curiosity taking over, he elected to ignore the warning and come even closer. Polished metal of an impeccable quality adorned the size of the machine. Even though some of it was marred by whatever caused the crash, the craftsmanship was remarkable. Something caught his eye. A small movement coming from behind a cracked piece of glass. At this point, the metal beast was billowing large puffs of smoke which made him cringe back. Frantic clawing was soon heard and to his surprise, the metal panel on the side slid open wide to reveal four Isva. The one that opened the metal panel coughed loudly, an arm over his mouth as he dragged another one by the collar of his uniform. The injured one seemed unconscious and made no movement as his rescuer threw him out of the smouldering wreckage. Chilukin moved to the side as another one of the Isva tumbled out. After dragging his companion out a few meters, it lay flat on his back, panting heavily. Chilukik looked inside and noticed there was one more Isva seated, however it also appeared unconscious. The flames that were causing the smoke increased in intensity, licking at the metal underbelly of the machine. Chilukik crawled inside and attempted to drag the Isva out to pull it with the others, but it was tied to his seat by some kind of straps. Snarling, Chilukik drew out a claw and severed the straps at their base, so as to avoid slicing the unconscious creature. Finally, with a bit of effort, he was able to drag the Isva out and lay it with the others some distance away from the fire. For smaller creatures, they sure were heavy. Looking at them more closely, he noticed they were thicker than he was, which likely explained it. As he sat down next to them, the one that had opened the panel managed to sit up as well. It rubbed his head and then looked around. Upon laying eyes on him, his facial demeanor changed instantly. It sprang up rapidly and drew what appeared like a small steam rifle from his waist, pointing it at him and shouting in a strange tongue. Nearby soldiers observing the whole thing began drawing their steam rifles in turn and pointing them at the Isva. Seeing the situation spiral out of control and wanting to try and keep peaceful relations with the Isva, Chilukik stood up in a non-aggressive manner, trying to position himself between the soldiers and the Isva. Move, chief scientist. We don't have a clear shot, warned one of the soldiers, rifle aimed and safety off. Chuluke protested, shouting back, Wait, no. It's hurt and confused, let's not escalate anything. With a war waging back in their homeworld, the last thing that a car need is another war through the gate, thought Chuluke. Something happened then. The Isva looked around, while still pointing a steam rifle aggressively but lowered it to the ground, and the racer's arm up high, as if it was trying to intimidate them with his size. Naturally, that challenge riled up the Dakar soldiers, making them approach and shout orders at the Isfa. Two soldiers each grabbed an arm of the Isfa and escorted it to the military command tent, while others secured the injured ones. Take the injured one to the barracks, or tend to their wounds, Chilukik said to the soldiers, grabbing the Isfa. A few of the other scientists within hearing distance stepped up, following Chilukik. Wow, I wouldn't know where to begin, honestly. Their biology seems too foreign compared to ours. Medical knowledge was not a primary discipline of his, but the war had made it a necessity to teach all those capable basic first aid. Start by trying to stop that bleeding. We can't do anything for their internal injuries but monitor them and then check if their condition changes. Continuing that train of thought, he added, It's true that we don't have the necessary knowledge to do this according to the way they would themselves, so keep them alive while I go try to get Third Claw Dantash to release the other Isfa so it can assist us. As overseer of the colony, Chilukik's authority was vast but not absolute. The generals, third, second and first clause, domains were war and defence, which this matter clearly fell into. No doubt they would exercise their right to interrogate the captive. Chuluke agreed in a way that there was much they could learn from the creature's knowledge. If they could find a way to learn his language, there might be better ways of doing so without resorting to torture. Chuluke pushed away the tense flap and approached the Takar in charge, third claw Dantash. The general was standing in front of the Isfa, looking down at it as two soldiers held it from either side. Find me some ropes so we can tie it down. I want half a company to watch over the medical tent, and there'll be hell to pay if any Isfa makes it out of there. 
Sensing a moment of silence that would soon evaporate, Shuluki jumped in. Sir, if I may, we could use this one's help to make sure the injured ones all survive. I need answers, head scientist. I need to know what to expect. The general's voice was firm. I'll tell you what to expect. If we torture that soldier, another war on our hands, came back Chuluki's reply. Dantash was unusually quiet and pensive. He needed to push ahead to convince him while he was debating it. Give me an armed escort to follow the Israel around. It'll be in the medical tent with the rest of them, and we'll try to use him to make sure we're healing the others well. If we can prevent any from dying, I'm sure they'll be grateful. Grateful prisoners are more cooperative. Not every enemy needs to be like the Veek. After what felt like an eternity, the general answered. I want a rotating two-person escort on him every second of the day. He'll also wear ankle restraints. Once the others are stable or dead, he comes back to me for interrogation. It was rather strict, but this was the only offer he was going to get. Understood, sir. Thank you. The soldiers followed the scientists outside, keeping their prisoner between them. Soon, all four of them found themselves in the medical tent. The injured Isfa laid down on long Dakar medical cots. The human prisoner seemed to get a bit more agitated, but the soldiers held him firmly. Another Dakar arrived then, holding a metal device in his hands that looked like a lock of some kind. While the other two held the human, the third Dakar installed the device around his feet, limiting his movement to a small shuffle. Having restrained the Isfa, his guard stopped holding him and took two steps back while maintaining their eyes on him. The human rubbed its arms where they had held him and looked around. Chulukik managed to catch his interest and waved him over, walking towards one of the injured. The female Isfa was unconscious and seemingly only had some slight injuries. The cuts and scratches on her arms and legs were tended to, having been wrapped in a fabric not too dissimilar to lengths of cloths. The prisoner looked over the injured Isfa and seemed to be somewhat relieved. It seemed to relax a bit. A blood-curling scream broke the calm, however, as one of the injured males screamed at the top of his lungs, twisting in agony on the next cot. The other was at his side almost immediately, shuffling quickly in his restraints and held to calm it down. The injured Isfa was cradling at his side, while the other bent low and talked softly to him. Chulukik paid close attention and watched as they communicated, exchanging information in a language unknown to him. Reaching some kind of agreement, they worked together to remove the top part of the injured Isfa clothing, while the prisoner inspected the injury more closely, sometimes prodding with his own hands, eliciting grunts from the other, Chulukik noticed it was rather swollen. Curious, he tried saying out loud what the Isfa had told the injured one. Three broken ribs. The sound did not come off exactly as he had heard it, but he imagined it would be possible with some practice. The Isfa exchanged a few more words, faster than Chukulik could make out, and then the prisoner stood up and turned towards the tent's exit as the one simply laid down. This prodded the guards to step up and block his path. Wait, urged Chukulik. Things are under control, let's just follow him. He may need something from the crash site. The guards looked at each other and allowed the Isfa to pass. It, however, did not go far, stopping just outside the tent to gather a handful of snow and compact it with his hands before heading back inside. Passing the guards and looking at him, the Isfa pointed at what had held in his hands and said, Snow. Ah, he must have heard me say something in his language and is now trying to teach me some of it. It would seem that Dengate is snow in their tongue. Approaching the cot where the other was laying down, Chulukik saw the injured one grit his teeth before the other laid down the sheet of snow on his injury. His muscles spasmed slightly, and then seemed to relax as numbing set in. The Isper proceeded to go around, looking at the other injured ones and examining them, as a doctor would. Although wanting to stay to study this, Chulukik knew he had a report to make, and so left the Ispers alone. At least he could now add in his report his observations, and recommend to work cooperatively with them. This is a grand mess, was the only thing going through the matriarch's head, as she read through her brother's report. The report was written in a positive light, but she knew the council would not see it that way. She began regretting even letting Chilukik ever step foot in that portal, let alone keeping him there. When the council was convened, maybe she could recommend releasing the prisoners to try and ease tensions with this new species. As she walked to the council chamber, she suddenly prayed that things would hopefully work out. She stopped at the door to take a breath and compose herself. She was the matriarch after all, and had to hide her stress. With bearing achieved, she swung the door open and approached her chair at the centre of the council. It was clear that everyone was on edge. This would make reason difficult. Members of the council, I'm sure you've all read the report on the situation on New Hope by now. I'm sure that my bro- She was cut off by one of the council members shouting. Your brother has had enough chances to get things right. I say we replace him with a more competent leader. 
The room echoed with murmurs. The matriarch was about to address the comment when another spoke up. We should just abandon new hope rather than risk another disaster, like the Master of Cantera. It seemed that the majority of council members agreed with that suggestion. She was quickly losing control, and if this meeting kept going in this direction, they'd surely lose any hope of surviving against the Veek. If I could just get a word... I say you put it to a vote. She had had enough. It was time to put her foot down. The matriarch slammed her fist down and shouted, SILENCE! The room fell silent, and every council member looked up to her surprised. It was very rare for her to raise her voice like that, but now that she had everyone's attention, she continued. What I am trying to say is that we can't just abandon new hope, not after all we invested in it. If you give it just one more chance, I'm sure we can turn things around. If we play our cards right, we could get the Iswa to help in our war efforts against the Veek. The council members talked among each other until one stood up, an old friend of the matriarch. I say it's worth a try. If worse comes to worse, we evacuate new hope and seal the portal. Votes were cast, and the decision passed with a four vote lead. It was close, but it was enough for another chance. The council dispersed from the room, leaving the matriarch sitting alone in her chair. She wouldn't have any more chances. She would have to make this one count. The matriarch left the council's chamber and headed for her quarters. It was getting late, and she grew tired. Her thoughts were filled with everything that could go wrong, and what would happen to her brother if those things did happen. It made her sick. Maybe not shutting down New Hope was a bad idea. She reached her room and was about to enter when she heard someone running behind her. Your Highness, Your Highness, I have news from New Hope. His tone was very urgent, which made the matriarch's heart drop. What is it? There's a formation of armed machines quickly approaching New Hope. They were extremely fast and may have already reached the outer defences. His words were like a punch to the gut. This couldn't be happening, not to her. The matriarch lost her balance and stumbled to the wall where she supported herself. She felt like she was going to vomit. She hadn't felt this bad since she heard about the deaths from the first battles of the Veek. And what are you calling them? Asked the general, peering out from the report. Uh, we don't really have a name for them currently, sir. Answered the junior officer, who helped draft out the report. The general flipped through the report, skimming over each paragraph. Something had caught his eye in the ocean of text, making him double over. They have scales under all that fur? Yes, sir. What about communication efforts? Have we made any progress? The prisoner's cooperation has been limited, only loosening up after we feed him. However, we have figured out a few words here and there. For example, we think they refer to humans as Isvar, but that's about the only useful information we could gather. Everything is in the report. Hmm. Thank you, Colonel. That'll be all. The junior officer saluted and made his way out. Sitting at over 128 pages, extensive was a modest word for it. A dozen or so specialists had been called in to help with the efforts to understand these aliens. Flipping through the pages, the general looked at the different titles and sections until he found what he was interested in. Technology. Many observations were made on the alien physiology, potential cultural reference and diet, but that was irrelevant to his duties. If they were to have a military conflict with this species, they need all the information they could get their hands on. Their weapons seem to function using high-density steam power. The effects of said projectiles can best be compared to standard .50 rounds. Although cumbersome, the alien appears to have no trouble wearing it, indicating training of some kind. The creature's outfit was seen to point towards belonging to a military organisation of some kind. These findings are supported by the various equipment and supplies if carried. If their training is as rigorous as ours, it might prove futile to try and break him. It does seem like food has provided some breakthroughs, however. Their technology has him scratching his head. How do they get here and have seemingly 200-year-old tech? The only explanation is that they are space spacefaring, but would that even be possible with steampunk-like equipment? As for their natural weapons, retractable claws as prominent on their hands and feet. For simplicity's sake, their sharpness can be compared to that of combat knives. They would be quite formidable in close quarters combat with such natural weapons. Maybe we should look into hard plate body armour in case of future conflict. The general's train of thought ended when a marine burst into his tent and looked out of breath. The marine stood there for a moment, catching his breath before looking up to his superior officer. The general gave an inquisitive look which seemed to remind the marine of where he was causing him to shoot up to the position of attention. Sergeant Stafford, sir. Communications. We have just lost contact with the helicopter you sent out earlier this morning after an untimely engine failure, and we believe it has landed in or near the alien compound, sir. The general let out a sigh. He thought today would be a good day, but of course something had to prove him wrong. 
He waved off the marine as he gathered himself to decide what the next course of action should be. It wasn't much time to mull it over. No, it wasn't the time for thought. He had to act. Before the marine had left the tent, the general stood up. Oh, and grab Colonel Lungario. Yes, sir. The marine then quickly shuffled out of the tent. A few minutes later, Colonel Lungario stepped in, but he was not alone. A woman dressed in a black suit tailed behind him and approached the general. She stuck out her hand and began to introduce herself. Hello, General Everton. My name is Agent Himrod. I'm a representative of several agencies, including some mutual friends in Washington, and we're afraid that because of this recent incident, your actions may go against our best interests. The general was a bit shocked at first, but always figured that this operation was being monitored by other bodies than the military. He decided his only real option was to fold to whatever her demands would be. It wouldn't be wise to go against whatever shady agencies she worked for. The list of three-letter agencies with long-reaching fingers was quite extensive. Everton stood up and shook her hand. All right. What did you have in mind? Well, it involves your prisoner. I will not handcuff myself while I have to deal with this situation, Agent Hemrod. If I have to initiate a full takeover of that compound, that's what I'll do. If I feel I can send a team in for an extraction, then that's what I'll do. There's just so much potential risk for so little to gain. And I must insist, we feel that a peaceful trade of personnel will be better in this situation. Personnel? You mean prisoners? God knows what these creatures are doing to my marines over there. Every minute we waste with the circus show, is potentially a dead marine on your hands. General, do you know how replaceable you currently are? Have you given a thought to how you acquired this assignment? No one wants to touch this with a hundred foot pole. No matter how good of a job you do here, the media will shred you a new one. This is a no-win scenario. Your own personal Kobayashi Maru. We can barely communicate with them. How are we to negotiate a deal? We still have some time. The Marines are still alive and are all being held in one location. Before you ask, no, I can't share any of my intel or resources with you. This can't be on the record. She excelled and continued. How about this then? You bring a substantial ground force, more or less a dozen vehicles, and drive up the main entry into the compound. We bring out the captured alien and they can likely figure out the rest from there. Worst case scenario, you storm the compound by force. The General thought for a moment before answering. Fine. But if there's even a hint of things going bad, I'm going to order my Bradleys to light that compound up. We'll be watching, so you should consider your orders wisely. It was fascinating watching the Isva work. Chulukik made several observations of the Isva anatomy as he watched it work. The first injury that the Isva had tended to didn't seem in great shape. The location of his injury was now multiple shades of colours, blue, purple and yellow. Chulukik was sceptical as to his survival, Perhaps that was why it had been held first and then mostly ignored. Its prognosis was likely not great. Most of the other scientists seemed to agree with this assessment, recalling some similar Dakar injuries that displayed these damages and ended in death. One of the others was now standing up, likely only having lost consciousness, and was now helping the uninjured Isva. Bo stood next to the one whose arm had been damaged. It hung limp and did not move. Watching with curiosity, Chulukik saw them hand a piece of wood which he used to place in his mouth while one of them held him down. Without any warning, the uninjured Isva grabbed the limp arm and exerted a massive amount of pressure on it, causing an audible snap to be heard by everyone present and a subdued scream from the victim. Nagar snapped to attention and began to move towards the prisoners, but then stopped as the limp-armed Isva stood up and began twirling his arm around for a few moments and then grimaced, stopping the obviously painful action. What the? muttered one of the guards, watching the miracle occurring in front of them. I was sure that he would lose that arm, said an incredulous scientist. They're rather sturdy. A fall from that height in that machine and then these injuries, and they don't seem much worse for wear, mumbled the other guard to himself. Just as he was about to get up and go look at the Issa's arm, a scout rushed in and intercepted him. Sir, there is an unidentified object approaching. Third Claw Dantash is requesting your presence. Walking outside the tent, he immediately noticed soldiers being deployed and taking defensive positions. The Isfa were likely coming for their soldiers. That's also what they would likely do in this situation. The general held command over this situation, unfortunately, and it would be hard to convince him to let the prisoners go free. Taking a position next to the third claw, he looked on towards the hill. Off in the distance, a single large metal vehicle could be seen approaching, cresting a small hill and coming down towards the camp. It looked almost like a solid block of metal, square in nature, and moving rather rapidly for an object of its size. 
Shalukic was slightly relieved to see only a single vehicle. It meant that the Isfah had likely come to negotiate and wouldn't escalate to war. As he thought this, another metal vehicle came over the hill following the first. However, compared to the first vehicle, this one seemed smaller, but Chilukit could clearly see a mounted steam rifle sitting atop of it. As he stood there and watched, two vehicles became three, then four and soon five. With each vehicle appearing, a small ball was forming in the pit of his stomach. For some time, after a total of six vehicles had been spotted, no more came. It seemed like the Isma wanted to do a show of force, meant they were serious perhaps, he thought. That faint hope that this would not end in bloodshed was shattered by the behemoths that followed much slower than the other vehicles. Those did not advance on wheels, but large chains of metal. Centre of their construction was the largest steam rifle that Chalukic have ever seen. Three of those hulking metal vehicles followed and formed into a triangle formation at the rear of the convoy when the terrain became wider and permitted it. Turning to face Dantush, Chalukic was distressed when he saw no apparent change in reaction from the man. It dawned on him that he was seriously considering standing up to the Isfa and starting a conflict if need be. The convoy stopped a small distance away and spread out. As they did so, Dantush barked orders. Take positions. If any of them come within 150 feet, open fire. Are you serious? Do you not see those giant steam rifle-like cannons on these vehicles? Even if we were to win this engagement, we know the Isfa also have some that can fly. Let's simply give them back their soldiers, and we can spare bloodshed on both sides. And let you have your ears for to keep the others alive, but I still haven't gotten any information out of them. We cannot show weakness here. We are at war with the Veek, but they do not know it. Perhaps they too are at war, and would not want to make an enemy out of us. I will not lay down here. Seeing there was no reason to do with the general, Chuluke resigned himself to do something he never thought he would. He began walking towards the convoy. Get to cover, don't stay out there, shouted Dantash behind him. He ignored him and pressed on walking with a good pace but not running, as he felt that could be mistaken for aggression. He shouted to the soldiers, hoping to reach at least some of them. Hold your fire. They probably only want their men back. Please, go get them, so they can see that they're alive. Seeing him approach, the lead vehicle also moved forward to meet him halfway. His heart beat fast, thumping loudly as he stood in front of the imposing metal beast. This one did not have a mounted rifle, but the four ears with a disembarked did, however. As they looked over at him and spread out around the vehicle, another Isva got out of the vehicle and approached him. This one did not have a weapon on him at first glance. It took out a piece of paper and looked at it before bringing his eyes back on him. Then, in the most broken Dakar he had ever heard, it said three words. Isva, change Dakar. Chiluki blinked a few times as he waited for a follow-up or more information, but none came. As he began trying to come up with possible meanings to what was said, the Isfa motioned to the others, and they went to the back of the vehicle and brought out something that surprised him. It was a Dakar scout which was tied up. The one in charge also showed a picture of Isfa's which matched the ones in their medical tent. Oh, they must mean exchange instead of change. Still within shouting distance to the camp, he turned around and yelled, They have one of ours. I want to do an exchange. Bring out the Isfa's. The sight of the Dakar scout seemed to have changed the general's mind, and he reiterated Chuluki's orders. Turning back around to face the scout, he began asking him questions in rapid succession before he could even begin answering the first one. Are you alright? What happened to you? Second range scout, hosh hosh, sir. I was captured while out on patrol, but I'm sure you piece that together. I'm mostly fine, sir. I'm not sure what is happening here, however. We are attempting to set up an exchange. Some Isra have crashed into our encampment, and we have taken them into custody. I see. I suppose I am rather lucky then, else I might have been in their custody for quite some time. It dawned on Chilukic that a general's intentions might have been more towards the fact that Scout Hoshtok held a lot of information on the Isfa than with his general's safety and well-being. Following the general's orders, the guards moved quickly and fetched the Isfas from the medical tent. The uninjured one helped two others move, and the one with the injured arm followed behind. Their gaze swept across the whole encampment, but their attitude only changed when they noticed the armoured vehicles. The guards stopped them some distance away, where many Dakar were entrenched and forming a defensive line. Chalukic had withdrawn slightly from the Isfa and was closer to the general, as they both waited for the prisoner exchange. I'm not too happy about losing these prisoners. We have the advantage with them as hostages, but if Hoshtok has any intel, it'll be much easier to get it out of him than them. I still think we could take them on, though. Chalukic nearly rolled his eyes. Do you not see those massive steam rifles mounted at the top of those vehicles? What about the barrels on those large plated ones? And therefore we could penetrate that shell. 
Movement from the Isma and the inner vehicles made both of them look that way. The lead Isma was coming forward with the scout in front of him. From the rear, however, every Isma there had his weapon trained on a Dakar in the compound. It's time, said Dantash. She looked at Galt and went to meet the prisoners. He motioned for them to move forward, in front of him, and they seemed to understand quickly enough, following his command. Walking in a line, both sides headed towards a middle area, more or less of equal distance between the armed Isva and the Dakar defensive line. As they got closer, the one leading Harshtok stopped, and Shalukik took that as a cue to stop as well. The Isvas he was escorting continued moving forward, and so did the scout, passing by each other's path. The scout soon reached Shalukik and continued moving, heading back towards the camp. Giving the Isva one last look, he turned his back to them, so as to follow Harshtok, but first steps behind him drew his attention. The Isra from the vehicle was right behind him, and then extended a hand forward, a short distance away from Chalukik's chest. It hung there in the air for a few moments, as Chalukik registered what was expected of him to do. He tended his arm out as well, thinking it was the Isra's way to salute, but then was surprised when the Isra grabbed his and shook it. As quick as the moment came, it was over. The Isra were all back into their vehicles and speeding away. Meanwhile at the Dakar camp, Dantash was ushering Haroshk, inside his tent for a private meeting. Chalukik stayed there for a few moments, looking at the vehicles disappearing over the hill, and thinking about how a disaster had been averted. Flipping his hand up, he squeezed and smiled. Perhaps the future wasn't so grim after all. Days blended together, but somehow it still felt like they had spent an eternity in the tent. Conversations with the Canadian soldiers grew dry by the second day. Not even Burdine could find something interesting to say. Only sitting around all day wouldn't be so bad if they hadn't confiscated Harrison's radio. It was only a matter of time before one of his marines was going to try to make MRE cookies again. The tent flap flew open, letting the sun shine inside and blinding everyone. It took a moment for Camus's eyes to adjust so he could see who was standing in the entrance. He wasn't sure who saw his rank first, but when Officer on Deck was called out, a pandemonium erupted in the tent as everyone clamoured to the position of attention. The officer stepped inside and in a low and gravelly voice said, You are all to report to General Everton's tent for your new assignment. I suggest you all make yourselves a bit more presentable beforehand. But be quick, the General is a busy man. With that, the Colonel stepped out of the tent, the tension leaving with him. A few awkward moments persisted before one of the Canadians started butting up his uniform. That seemed to be the spark that exploded the tent into chaos, as everyone quickly tried to make their uniforms presentable. For the quicker they finished, the quicker they'd be able to get out of that damn tent. Campos was the first one out, letting him enjoy a few moments alone in the fresh air. Soon, one by one, they gathered outside the tent enjoying a moment of bliss, snowfall lightly coating them. They did not linger there for too long before they began walking towards the general's tent. Campos wasn't in much of a hurry, it was only fair that they could make the general wait a bit, as they were forced to do. They shoveled into the general's tent to find that there were some chairs set up. Everyone took their seats, Campos making sure to sit in the front. After a few minutes, the general entered, causing them to spring to attention. The general stood at the front, appearing to size up each and every one of them. After the general's quick inspection, he ordered for everyone to take their seats. This morning, we lost contact with one of our helicopters while it was doing the flyby of the alien compound. We soon found out that it crashed nearby, and all four marines inside were captured. After a short discussion, we decided the best course of action was to trade the prisoner that you had captured in exchange for the marines. This exchange happened two hours ago, and has made something apparent to us. We need a specialised force for all dealings with these Dakar, as we now know them. Whether that be through cooperation or competition. The General took a sip of water, pausing his speech briefly before resuming. You, along with the task force that were set to make the trade, are now part of this new operation. You will all be under a new chain of command, made up of both Canadian and American officers, you will not answer to anyone who is not a part of this operation, for you are all under direct administrative control. Before anyone objects, according to Regulation 14010, Section 29, such assignments are within my purview and jurisdiction. When the General's briefing seemed to be at a pause, Patrick raised his hand. The General looked to him and awaited his question. What is this new operation called, sir? Operation Snow Eagle. 